am so glad you guys are here this morning. We are starting a new series, as you can see behind me, Idols, I Am Who I Worship. This series has been in my heart for a really long time, uh, and it's, it, you know, it's been a very interesting season. Can I be honest with you guys? Is, is that cool? Is it cool if I be honest? Is We, have, we family here, right? Everybody good? All right, good. Some of y'all are like, no, please don't stop. Uh, so uh, God has laid out literally almost to the end of the year for me and what we're going to be walking through in his word. Now, that has never happened before in my life, okay? And I've been in ministry for over 10 years and all sorts of things, but he has literally lined it up. like He's like literally telling me, it's like T-ball. You just got to walk up. And you just got to swing, okay? And I'll do the rest, all right? Just walk up and swing. And, you know, I've been thinking, it, it was interesting. I was talking to my brother Isaiah outside this morning when he got here. And uh, I was, uh, he was just telling me about the interesting things happening in his ministry and, and transition and all sorts of stuff. And, and I was beginning to tell him the other night, I was reading, and uh, Paul brings up this fact. And he says, we need the Spirit to teach us how we ought to pray. How we ought to pray. I don't know if you've ever stopped and thought about that for a minute. Um, but sometimes I rush into things and I think I've got it, you know, but it's like when I read his word, like it's so clear to me that I don't even know how to pray, man. I don't even know how to do any of that. And so I need the spirit every step of the way. So when we sing that last song, it really, it really got to me because you understand we're going to be talking about identity the next couple of weeks. And you got to understand if you are outside of Christ, you, you don't know who you are because in Christ, that is your true identity as a Christian. In Christ, that's where our true identity should always lie. But you got to understand something. You don't bring anything to the table. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. He gives you everything that you have that is truly good. God gives it to you. See, and I'll take it even a step further. Me personally, I don't know about you, but I couldn't even make it to the table. He had to carry me because I was so messed up. Some of you can relate to that. You think about it and you think, man, God had to pick me up and he had to carry me to even get to the table. I couldn't even make it. That's the good God that we serve. I want you to understand that. We're going to be talking about idols and things that we get in our lives that we put before Christ. But I want you to understand this is not a series to beat you over the head with what you're doing wrong, okay? This is a series to show you what you can be in Christ, what you can do in Christ, what he has for us and what you are in Christ. Amen? You know, I just feel, I feel the need. Let's pray real quick. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that you're already speaking, that you're already ministering. Holy Spirit, I surrender to you completely. This is your service. I need you. Just teach me how I ought to pray. Teach me how I ought to preach. Teach me what I need to say, Father. I'm dependent on you completely. We surrender to you in this place. I pray you open these wonderful people's hearts. God, that this word would take root. Lord God, and if they are struggling in this place today with who they are, with their identity, Lord, I pray by the time they hit that back door, God, they are confident in who they are in you. And in Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen. Praise God. So idols, I am who I worship. So who are you? You ever been asked that question? You've been sitting down, hey, who are you? Usually our first, this is, I've noticed this a lot. This is our first instinct is we say what we do, right? Who are you? Well, I'm an electrician. Oh, really? That's who you are, huh? You're an electrician. That's it. That's, no, that's what you do. That's not who you are, right? But a lot of times we do. We equate who we are with what we've done, right? Who are you? Well, I, I do this. I do this. We got, we got some people in here, man, they got some pretty cool jobs, all right? I'm not going to lie. Some of y'all in here, you got some really killer jobs. You do some awesome stuff, but that's not who you are. But yet we, 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 that's how we respond a lot of times. That's how the world has ingrained us. Your value has some kind of monetary thing attached to it. How much money do you make? Well, that's how important you are. That's not how the Bible sees it. It's not at all. So we're going to look at something different. See, there are many in the church that have no clue who they are. There are many that come to church week after week after week, and they have no idea who they are. It's crazy to me, but it happens, right? People come to church each week, they hear sermons, they hear messages, but yet personally, they don't know who they are. Personally, they leave here and they think, but, good, but does God really love me? But maybe it's for all those better people, it's not really for me. Maybe it's for them, it's not really for me. Who are you? Who are you? I want you to really think about that. Who are you? See, when we don't know or we lose sight of who we are, we lose our purpose or we don't even know it to begin with. If we don't know that, the answer to that question, we lose sight of our purpose. You know, I recently saw The Lion King. Has anybody seen it yet? 
Anybody? No? Some of you are like getting a little mixed emotions. Some of you are like, I loved it. Some of you are like, I hated it. They ruined everything. My childhood's over, right? Uh, so we recently went and saw The Lion King because my wife loves Disney and I do whatever my wife does. I'm a good husband. So, you know, you know how that goes. Anyway, but I, I personally really loved The Lion King growing up. So I went and saw it. Man, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the mess out of it. They didn't change much. It was very enjoyable. I was like, great. They didn't ruin it. That's awesome. So I enjoyed it. But, you know, there's this interesting scene that happens. You know, Simba runs away from his identity. He runs away from who he is, right? He gets out all alone, Akuna Matata, right? The past don't matter. I don't care. I'm going to eat bugs, right? All that whole party. It's, you know, great. And then, the, the, you know, the monkey shows up, tells him, hey, you need to go back, all that stuff. And his dad shows up in the clouds. How awesome, right? Some of y'all wish, man, God, I wish you would just show up in the cloud, right? <laughs> just be like, hey, you know, come and I see ya, right? I'm, I'm going to give you a word, bro, right? So his dad comes out of the clouds, and one of the things he says to him that always moves me, you know, anybody else get chills when you hear Mufasa talk? You're like, Mufasa, you're like, ooh, wow. <laughs> you know, so he comes out of the cloud, and he's like, Simba, right? I wish I could do it, man. I, I sound like a little boy compared to the guy that does the Mufasa, James Earl Jones, right? But he comes out, and he says, Simba. And one of the things he tells him is he's, you for, he says, you've forgotten me. That's what I was like, about to start walking around the theater, right? (laughs) You've forgotten me. What you've forgotten? That I'm your father. So that makes you the king. And I was like, Shanda, right? I started throwing, whoo, praise dance, right? Wall's about to come down, right? (laughs) I mean, I start start moving. My wife's like, what's going on? I'm like, nothing, nothing sweet. It's just Holy Spirit, hallelujah, right? (laughs) But he realized something. He had lost sight of who he was. So he ran away from his purpose and he almost lost what was supposed to be his, the kingdom that was promised to him. He almost lost it. But in that moment, his father shows up and he reminds him who he is. And then all of a sudden, we get the montage. Everybody loves the montage, right? He's throwing through the desert. It's like, dum, 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 right? All this stuff's happening. It's epic. Some of y'all, you've forgotten who you are, and I've got great news for you today. You're about to hit that montage when you leave here. You're going to be going. You're going to be confident. You're going to know who you are in Christ, and it's only the beginning. I'm telling you, man, God's got some good stuff. Amen? Do you receive that? Awesome. Praise God. Maybe you've heard this said. I want you to think about this. Have you ever heard you were created to worship? Anybody ever heard that? Raise your hand. You've heard that? Yeah. It's pretty popular. Um, I get what they're saying. I get it. I get it. But more accurately, I want you to understand something. According to the Bible, we are created worshiping, okay? We are born worshiping. Understand everyone worships. It's just about who you're worshiping. You understand? So we weren't just created to worship. See, when you say that, when you say, well, we were created to worship, understand that that might suggest that God is incomplete without it, okay? That means if you're not worshiping God, he's somehow up there being like, oh, I've been weakened. Oh, oh, I just wish they'd lift their hands when we sing this awesome Hillsong song. I just... Oh my gosh, he ain't struggling. But understand, God loves your worship. He, he leans forward to hear it. You imagine he's got all these angels around him singing and he hears one of you singing really bad out of tune and he's like, man, I love that. Sing a little louder, right? Even though your neighbor's like, sing a little softer, please. Right? But I wanna, I wanna hear it, right? He, he loves our worship. But understand, he doesn't need it. See, because God doesn't need you, he wants you. Do you understand that? And that's so much better. That's so much better. He wants you. He doesn't need you. He wants you. It's amazing to me when we get that. But if we are created in the image of God who is constantly pouring out himself into himself and then into us, then by the same token, we pour out. Understand, you're made worshiping. You are constantly pouring out into someone or something. That's what happens. We as people, we need something to worship. So people find things to worship. If it isn't God, it will be something else. You follow me? Worship is not merely an aspect of our being, but it's the essence of our being. So many times we have this misunderstanding that worship is just what happens here on Sunday morning. We come in together, right? This is what we call corporate worship. Or I'm throwing some church words at you today. Corporate worship. When we get together and we worship God together, it's incredible, right? Does everybody like worship? Yeah? Amen? Yeah. Especially we've got awesome worship leaders like Mrs. Day and Stacey up here just, just killing it. And this whole team, man, they're awesome. But the thing is, that's corporate worship. I hope and I pray that this is not the only time that you worship. Because you're missing it. See, but when we leave here, we are worshiping something. And we choose what we're worshiping by our decisions, by our actions. 
And see, what we worship, what we pour into, that's what we pull our identity from. That's why I said I am who I worship. Because who I am worshiping, that is where I am getting my identity from. That's where it's rooted. Because that's what I'm worshiping. That's what I'm pouring into. Our worship never starts or stops. It's not confined to a building, praise God. Our entire lives is devoted to pouring ourselves into someone or something. It is in what we worship, poor, right? I want you to remember that, poor. It's what we worship that we draw our identity from. As a Christian, if there's something we are pulling our identity from that isn't Christ, I've got news for you, that thing is an idol. That's what it is. So many times we hear idol and we think about, you know, building a big statue, right, and the way people would worship and sacrifice. And we're like, man, I don't do anything crazy like that, right? I don't like dance around in my backyard around a fire or anything. Like, nothing weird, right? But the thing is, is if you're putting anything, anything in front of Christ in your life, if you're pulling your identity from anything that isn't Christ as a Christian, that thing is an idol, plain and simple. I can't make it any clearer than that, so I definitely, definitely hope you, you followed me on that one. 1 John 3.1. Let's look at some of the things the Bible says we are. First John 3, 1. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. There's some guys that I know really well, right? There's some guys I know really well, like, uh, like uh, Pastor Derek Donnelly, right? I know him and his wife very, very well. And if I saw Paul, his son, if I saw Paul walk into a place, even if I didn't know Paul was Derek's son, right, and I saw him walk into a place, I would know that's Derek's kid. You know why? Looks just like him. Just like him. He walks in, he does the same mannerisms, same movements, everything. That is D, all right? That's the D I went to high school with, okay? It's him. He walks in, right? I'm like, hey, I know that kid. That must be Derek's son. Why? Because I know his father. So see, the world doesn't recognize us sometimes. Why? Because they don't know our father. They don't recognize it. It's amazing to me. So we are God's children. He says we are his children. See, to know who you are, you have to know whose you are. You have to know who you belong to, and we belong to him. We belong to him. We are his children. Next verse, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Throw that up there. It says, don't you realize, don't you realize, you realize when, I'm going to say this, you realize when, don't you realize that when you start with that, that means you don't realize. You get that, right? Like if I say, do you realize I probably think you don't. That's why I'm saying it, okay? Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy, and guess what? You are that temple. Man, wait a minute. That changes everything. You mean the spirit of God lives in me? You mean he dwells in me? Do you realize the kind of protection I have? Do you, man, who do you want backing you up? I, man, I can't think of anybody better. He says, man, I protect this temple. This is my temple, and that's what you are. You are holy, my temple. So don't you realize, understand, Paul is bringing this up. He's, he's bringing this up because they're people that he's responding to in this letter. They were literally going around, and they were saying, oh, well, who do you follow? Do you follow Apollos, or, or do you follow Paul? Like, who led you to Christ? They're pulling their identity from who led them to Christ instead of Christ himself. So Paul is literally saying, don't you realize who you are? You're creating idols in your life. You're even using me and another disciple of Christ who are good men doing good things, but we are not God. Do not pull your identity from us. He has to let them know, do you realize who you are? See, because when we don't realize who we are, we create idols in our lives. Man, I hope you get that. We create idols when we don't realize who we are. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. I'm throwing a lot at you. I know it. Get ready. There's even more. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all my favorite part, the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Hey, hallelujah. Some of you are like, praise God. Roaches are under my feet. Hallelujah. 27. So God created man in his own image image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I just blew up the internet right there. Male and female, he created them. Okay, I'm going to walk away. So we are image bearers. We bear the image of God just by existing. Do you understand that? It is not about anything that you can do. The fact that you exist, you bear the image of God. 
I'm, I'm going to be real with you, okay? I, I'm not going to get political right now. I'm not. I'm not I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to get political. But I want you to understand something. I am very pro-life. And I want you to understand why I'm very pro-life. Because God is pro-life. Okay? The scripture backs that up. You want to come argue with me? Come on. I'll show you where it's at. He's very, very pro-life. Okay? I want you to understand that. God is pro-life. But understand, as somebody that supports pro-life, people sometimes try to debate, well, we're creating the image of God because we can feel things. We're creating the image of God because we have emotions. Yes, God gave you all those great things. But understand, even if you didn't have any of that, you are still bearing the image of God just by existing. That's why I say a baby has a right to live because it is the image of the most holy God. Amen? Man. We bear the image of God. It's not about what you can do. It's about who you are. Who you are. See, we reflect the image of God. And you want want to know some good news? We reflect the image of God. You know what still reflects? Mirrors reflects, right? Mirrors will reflect things. I want you to think about this. Even a mirror that's dirty and broken still reflects. It still reflects. Some of you, man, I've been through some things. You don't know my past. You don't know what I've gone through. Guess what? You still reflect. God can still use you. He still loves you. And he wants to use you. Know who you are in Christ. He wants to use you. So we're an image bearer. In this series, we're going to look at a couple things. Throw up that the acronym thing I have there, Jacob. Awesome. Common idols found in our lives. <sighs> I know you're thinking this is pretty clever, right? It's a little acronym here. We got items for the I, duties for the D, our jobs, things we do, others, right? longings, things we're hoping for, things that are coming, right? And sufferings. I also like to add on this um, self because a lot of times there's a lot of us in here that worship ourself. Let's be honest. So sufferings, self. So these are some things we're going to be talking about, things that we commonly make idols. But we'll also be looking at what we are when we are in Christ. See, in Christ we are regenerated, we're justified, we're sanctified, and then one day we're going to be glorified. Amen? Amen. You got that? Okay, four steps salvation process. Pastor Brittany really kind of broke that down a little bit last week, and it was so brilliant and so beautiful, so I don't really feel the need to really break the hashtag anymore. If you missed it, go on YouTube, check out the sermon. It's great. But these are benefits we have in Christ. We get regenerated, right? We get new desires, and then we become sanctified. So that's awesome. That's a a position, right? That's a position, but it's also a process. It's an ongoing process that we can begin to enjoy living a holy life because that's what we desire. Amen? So he gives us these things in Christ. So Ephesians 1, 1 through 2. I'm going to read this beginning of this letter. We're going to be looking a lot in Ephesians. Okay, and I'll explain why. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to, to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to the first verse. Back up one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints. He's writing to the church in Ephesus and he calls them saints. See, a lot of people breeze through these greetings, but I want you to understand something. Paul just established the entire book of Ephesians right there to the saints. He didn't say to the sinners. He didn't say to the screw-ups. He didn't say to the wannabes. He said to the saints who are in Christ, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. He called them saints. I find that interesting. I'm a saint. I'm a saint. You know, I'm constantly wondering, I'm like, did did maybe the church in Ephesus didn't have screw-ups? in their church like we do today, right? Like maybe the, maybe the church of Ephesus didn't have people that sometimes they like to gossip, right? Maybe the church of Ephesus didn't have people that sometimes they lie, right? Maybe the church of Ephesus, no, 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 they did. They did. But yet he called them saints. I'm like, man, okay, all right. We're, we're going to dig into that a little bit. Calling them saints. See, Paul is calling those in Christ, in other words, true Christians, saints. Paul will go on to use this term in Christ overtly 12 times and then 22 times in various forms in the ESV version of Ephesians in a book with only six chapters. Think about that. He's going to say in Christ 12 times. He's going to reference a version of in Christ 22 times. You think it's important? Yes, it's very important. It's very important. Those two words change everything in Christ. We will discover in Ephesians that we are either in Christ or in idolatry. There isn't a middle ground. You're not like in some middle place. You're like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm not really in Christ, but, you know, I'm not really worshiping idols. No, you are. Let me just make it easy for you. You are. If you're not in Christ, you're worshiping an idol. There you go, right? Easy. 
So Ephesians, well, he's writing to the church at Ephesus. I want, you to, I want to give you a little history here. He's writing to this church that's in like a modern day Chicago, LA. Okay, that's what I want you to think. There's a lot of things coming to this place, right? There's a lot of people coming to this place. When they write a letter, the reason he wrote to the church in Ephesus is because it was like a hub. So when he wrote it there, it was going to be dispersed to all the other churches in Asia Minor, all right? So it's easy, right? You're like, I just write one letter and have to write all of these, right? I'll just send one. They'll cycle it around. It'll be great, okay? So I'm going to send it to the church in Ephesus. It was a hub, kind of like I told you, modern day Chicago, LA. It was most likely written to address newer Christians converted from pagan or Jewish backgrounds who were tempted to go back into their former lifestyles. So what are they struggling with? Identity. They're being tempted to go back into a different lifestyle, struggling with identity. It was a hodgepodge of world religions. There were all sorts of religions there. The Temple of Artemis was there, which was like a, 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 like a wonder of the world, right? So many people came there. It was famously known, and we'll get this, a lot of people visited the Temple of Artemis. I'm about to explain why. It was famously known for its temple prostitutes, okay? Yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, it's no good, right? So that's why people go to church, right? They're like, you going to church? Yeah, I'm going to church. Okay, well, that's all right. That's not good. So people came from all over the world there to worship there, and it was big time revenue for the city. Okay, so I want you, I just, I'm trying to give you a backdrop here. It was politically powerful city. There was a lot of power there, but it was also extremely corrupt, an extremely corrupt government. It was very, very corrupt, and the city itself was steeped in immorality. It was just all over the place. I just explained to you, there was literally a temple that's huge that everybody comes with to sleep with prostitutes, right? Okay, everybody got that? Okay, so you understand that, that it's bad, okay? It's a bad, bad situation. There are plenty of idols available to worship. This was the city in which this letter was written to. I'm gonna read you a couple, a, a, a couple opening verses here, and I want you to catch, one thing I want you to look for is how many times Paul references in Christ in just these few verses. Go to the next, next verse in Ephesians. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. I'd love to spend some time on that, but we're going to keep moving for right now. Because we are united with who? Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance, hallelujah, to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through who? Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. He wasn't obligated to do it. He enjoyed doing it. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. He has showered, showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious, mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. Why did he do it? Because he wanted to. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of who? Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with who? Christ. We have received an inheritance from God for he chose us in advance and he makes everything work according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in who? Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, praise God, that's me, have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you. He identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Woo! I hope you caught that. I'm going to need a towel first. I'm like, I'm dying up here. I'm dying. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. I want to go back to something real quick. Paul calling us a saint. How many of you times have you heard in church, well, I'm just a sinner. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's it. Praise God, I'm just a rotten sinner. Just a dirty, rotten, horrible sinner. <laughs> You're like, well, praise God. I want to, I want to be one of those too, I guess. Hallelujah, <laughs> right? No, no, yes, yes. We came to Christ, we were sinners, you bet. You came to Christ, you were sinners, and you go, oh, praise God for his grace, because there was no way you would have made it without it. True statement. But understand, when you come to Christ, Paul says, now you are a saint. Stop calling yourself a sinner. You're a saint. That's who you are in Christ. Man. Romans 8, 2 through 1, throw that up. 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. There is now no more condemnation for those in Christ, right? Praise God for that. No more condemnation. We are not what we do. Rather, we do what we are. Our identity, I want you to catch this. Our identity determines our activity. Get in position and watch your practice change. We are not what we do. We do what we are. Some of you have struggled with that your entire life. You know, there's a, there's a saying that, that we've talked about several times. You're going to hear me say it so many other times because it's so key. And that is practice doesn't make perfect when you're following Christ. Position makes perfect. I want you to understand that because out of your position, your actions flow. See, so many people do this. They come to church, they, they give their life to Christ, and then they're trying to work their way into God's good graces somehow. They're trying to work their way into salvation. Like maybe if I just cut back on this, cut back on this, and I try really hard, God's going to no, 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 no. See, what you need to do first is you need to get into position. You need to get in what God has called you to be in Christ. And then watch as your life transforms, and all of a sudden you don't desire that stuff anymore. All of a sudden you're not doing those things you used to do. All of a sudden you're getting convicted when you start doing these things that you didn't think were a big deal, right? And you're just like, I don't really want to do that anymore. Why? Because you're in Christ. you got to get in position. Practice does not make perfect. Position makes perfect. We understand, though, understand we will still struggle with sin. Sin still happens. I'm not saying it won't. Check this out. First John, throw it up there. It still happens. If we, have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. All right, cool. And the truth is not in us. Okay, there we go. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, praise God, our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Understand, you're a saint. You're not a sinner, but you are a saint that occasionally struggles with sin. That is not who you are. You are not, that is not your identity. See, what happens is sometimes we fail and we immediately just go, oh, I guess I'll just go whip myself about 10 times and maybe that'll please the Lord. Just whoosh, 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 right? Like, and, and like just beat myself up and talk bad about myself and say how I'm not worthy and how I'm not all this thing. And God's just looking at you like, man, just ask for forgiveness, yo. Like repent, get back out there. My goodness, you're a saint. You are not a sinner. This is not who you are. Put it down. That is not your identity. Stop carrying it around. That is not who you are. You are a saint. Man, I wish, oh man, I wish somebody just in here, you catch that. You just catch it. Man, you just go burn the world down for Jesus, all right? It's going to be good. So we understand that we still struggle with sin. We understand sin is still private. See, in Christ, we are no longer a sinner, but we are a saint. We still live in a fallen world where sin is present. It's still around us. It's still around. Until that day we go home to be with Jesus, until that day God sets up his kingdom on earth, sin is still here. What does that mean? That we're going to deal with it. But understand, we can overcome it. Why? Because of Jesus Christ, who we are in. He gives us the strength to do it. Important note. I wrote this down. Important note. It's important. I almost missed it. Important note. Outside of Christ, we can't please God. Stop trying because you ain't going to do it. Get in Christ. That's how you please God. I'm going to show you this. Romans 8.8. 8. Throw that up. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay. Let me, I'm, all right. I'm going to break it down for you. Ready? Flesh equals yourself. When you're in your flesh, when you're doing works in your flesh, you're doing works out of your own strength, out of this flesh. Some of y'all are a little more impressive than me, right? In the, the arm department, you're like, yeah, I can do a lot more in my flesh, right? Whatever, man, I'm in Christ. Hallelujah. Okay? <laughs> Grab me another donut. Praise God. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, what about gluttony? Okay, just, just shut it. Don't you judge me. All right. Knowing your identity will keep you from giving into temptation, and it is what will launch you forward into God's purpose for your life. Let's look to Jesus' example. So before he was tested by Satan and before he was murdered by the people he came to save, that's pretty lame, right? We see the Father affirm his identity. I want to show you where. Luke 3, 22. Luke 3, 22. Throw that up. It says, and the Holy Spirit descended on him after he's baptized in a bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son with you. I am well pleased. That is Father God affirming the son who he is. And then right after that, he goes into the wilderness to be tested by Satan. Right? Let me show you another point. Luke 9, 35. Throw that up. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. 
Listen to him. This is my son. There are several times where we see the father affirm to the son who he is. If Jesus needs the reminder, guess what? You do too. You get it? I need to know who I am in the father. I need to know my identity. I need to be reminded sometimes. So he lets us know. See, Satan tried to get Jesus to prove he what, who he was. So Satan was like, hey, do tricks so you can prove that you're the son of God, right? And the people tried to beat him into denying it. And he did neither. Why? Because he knew who he was. And you can do the same. You can do the same. See, because Satan will try to get you to prove things all day long. Well, I don't know. Prove you're a Christian. Look at your life. I don't know, you know, I don't know but prove you're a Christian. People will try to convince, make you deny it. Well, it's compromise, compromise, compromise. Well, that hurts my feelings. Compromise, compromise, compromise. Look, I don't care if the word of God says it. I believe it because that's who I am in Christ. I'm in Christ Jesus. Luke 9, 28 through 29. I'm going to read this little verse to you. It says, now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. And his clothing became dazzling white. So this happens in the tr transfiguration happens on the mountain, right? This is an amazing moment. But I really want to look at something here. And we see, we see him do this often. We see this happen a lot. Jesus prays quite a bit. And it says, as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. See, I want you to understand something. The more time you spend with the Father, the more concrete your identity becomes to you and to those around you. So the more time you spend with the Father... Your identity becomes more concrete to you and to those around you. Some of you are like, man, I struggle with knowing who I am. How much time do you spend with the Father? How much time do you spend in prayer? How much time do you just get alone with God and say, God, I just, I need you. Speak to me. Minister to me. I need you. Because when you do, you walk out of there understanding who you are. Just like Jesus says, his face, his face was literally altered, right? You could tell. There was something happening there. There was something going on. The more time you spend with him makes all the difference. I want you to understand something. Every generation, every generation gets deceived. Every single one. Every single generation that has walked this earth has been deceived. At one time or another, they thought that they could find their identity in something that wasn't Christ. Every single generation gets deceived. They get deceived into thinking they can find their identity in something or someone that isn't Christ. When we don't know who we are, we lose sight of what Christ has done for us, and we can be deceived, especially when we allow pride to puff us up. I can't tell you how many Christians I know get on social media, and they want to let everybody and their brother know how much they know. Look, I don't care, all right? I don't care. I want to know what God is doing through your life. Is he moving in power? Is God's power present in what you are doing? Are lives being changed? Are you being changed? Do you know who you are? But see, sometimes we get a little prideful in what God's done in our lives, and sometimes we, we can get in this place where we think we're better than somebody else because of what God's done in our life. The Bible calls that being puffed up, and it's not good. I want you to understand, the enemy deceives, the world deceives, and unfortunately, sometimes the church deceives. <laughs> right? Unfortunately, it does. I want to read the scripture to you. We're about wrapping this up here. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. But you need to be aware that in the final days, the culture of society, I want you to catch that, the culture of society. We don't have the same culture as society. We shouldn't look like society. We have a different culture, a Jesus culture. Oh, look at that. That was good. The culture of society will become extremely fierce. People will be self-centered lovers of themselves and obsessed with money. I don't know anybody like that. They will boast of great things as they strut around in their arrogant, what? Pride and mock all that is right. They will ignore their own families. They will be ungrateful and ungodly. They will become addicted to hateful and malicious slander. We don't live in a day where people like to talk bad about each other, do we? Y'all don't see that on the internet, do you? I mean, I've, I don't see it usually. Slaves to, slaves to their desires, they will be ferocious, ferocious, belligerent haters of what is good and right. With brutal treachery, they will act without restraint, bigoted and wrapped in clouds of their conceit. They will find their delight in the pleasures of this world more than the pleasures of, love, of the loving God. They may pretend, this is where the church deceives sometimes, they may pretend to have respect for God, but in reality, they want nothing to do with his power. People start getting delivered, some weird stuff starts happening. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know, brother, I don't know. Man, I don't want to deny God's power. 
See, because understand, it's his power. It's his anointing. It's the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit working through us that changes things. It's the anointing. It's the power of the word of God. It's not a person. I don't ever want to deny his power. Stay away from people like these. Okay, cool. There it is. For they are the ones who worm their way in the hearts of vulnerable women spending the night with those who are captured by their lust. They have idols and are steeped in sin. They are always, man, this part gets me every single time. They are always learning, but never discover the revelation, knowledge of truth. They're always learning, but they have no revelation. They don't even know what it means, but they know it. They know it, but what does it mean? It hasn't unlocked any power in their life. So you come through and you hear the scripture week after week, but yet if your life isn't being changed, you're just hearing it, you're learning it, but you don't have the revelation of who you are in Jesus Christ. You don't know who you are. Uh, if you take notes, I want you to write this down. And maybe you can put it on a post-it somewhere where you can see it on a regular basis. I want you to understand this. Pride is the enemy of our identity. I want you to get it. If you like to tweet, you can tweet that one. That's a good tweetable quote right there. I sent that to Mike joking with him. Tweetable quote. But it's true. Pride is the enemy of our identity. Pride will deceive you. Pride will keep you bound. Pride will keep you in that chair when you need to go back to get prayer. Pride will keep you bound up. Pride will destroy your marriage. Pride will destroy you. Pride does nothing good for you. Let me, let, me, let me show you in the word of God. Proverbs 8, 13, throw that up there. This is, the one of, this is one of many, and I mean many. Do yourself a favor, go on Google, say verses about pride. Just do that, just for fun, just for giggles. Okay, and read through each and every one of them. You'll understand how much God hates pride. It says, all who fear the Lord will hate evil. Okay, what did he just say? They'll hate evil, right? Therefore, what does he hate? What's the first thing mentioned? I hate pride and arrogance, corruption, and perverse speech. God hates pride. I want you to understand that. It's listed among the things that he hates. He hates pride. Why? Because it will destroy you. Pride pulls you away from your identity, and pride is exactly the thing the devil uses to enslave you. It's pride. Instead, in Christ, Brittany talked about this some last week. I love how the Holy Spirit works like that. Amen. Instead, in Christ, we are to be clothed in humility. That's what it tells us we, we, we desire, we long for. Be clothed in humility. Stop thinking so highly of yourself. Put your head lower to the ground. Okay, quit it. You're not that awesome. All right, literally, there's a one point in scripture Paul says, if you think you're really cool, you're not. That's awesome. I love the word of God. It's amazing. You guys just you read it, man. It's awesome. Clothe yourself. Throw up First Peter. First Peter 5, and this is just the second part of it. It says, likewise, you who are along, oh, sorry, I'm going I'm to skip down a little bit. So clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes pride. You cannot find your identity if you're prideful. You can't find your identity. You will lose your identity if you get prideful in who you are. Prideful will knock you out, but it says be clothed in humility. Just a few verses later in this same chapter, we see Peter tells us that we need to be ready because the devil is looking to destroy, to destroy us. How do we get ready? We put on humility and we stay in Christ. He says, look, the devil's looking to see whom he can devour. He's looking for somebody that's prideful. He's looking for somebody that thinks they can do it on their own and that they don't need Christ. And he says, as soon as I find that person, I'm going to destroy them because it's so easy. But see, he tells us to be clothed in humility. Knowing your identity is one of the most important steps in your walk with Christ. Get in Christ. I want you to listen to me. This is your action steps. Are you ready? Get in Christ. Kill the pride. Put on humility. Listen to me. If you're in Christ in this room, if you serve Jesus Christ, if he is living in you, right, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you, you surrender your life to Jesus, I want you to hear me on this. You are a saint. You are a saint. That is what Paul called you. You're a saint. Why? Because you're in Christ. Is it something you've done? No. You know what's amazing? If you look at the, like, uh, anybody here, maybe you grew up Catholic? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, a few. All right, a few of us. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. So you grew up Catholic. You know, you've heard of being a saint, right? Sainthood. Have you seen the list of how you do that? It's insane, man. Like, you, you better hope for a miracle. Because, like, it's like you got to do this, you got to do this, another miracle, right? You got to pray for another miracle. You got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this. And then the panel of some, some guys will get together and they'll decide, yes, he is a saint. Congratulations, you've been sainted, right? Awesome. 
that's how the Catholic Church views it. Okay, whatever. But let me tell you how the Bible views it. You ready? You get in Christ. Boom. That's it. I'm not kidding with you. Some of you are like, nah, you joke. No, I'm serious. You get in Christ. You surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You get in position and watch how he begins to transform your life. As you begin to surrender the idols that are surrounding you, begin to surrender the things that you've been holding on to, that you've been worshiping, you've been pulling your identity from. You've been getting affirmation from things that aren't Jesus Christ, and it's an idol. Leave it today. I'm telling you, leave it today. Don't go home with it. Leave it today. I want to pray really quick. Bow our heads. Ushers, you can get ready um, for communion. I want to pray. If you're in here today, who are we talking about? Who we are. And I know we, we talked about a lot of scripture. We laid a, a big foundation because this series is, I mean, I, I really want you to get this. But if you're in here and you say, you know what? Matt, I, man, I do not have a relationship with Jesus. I am not in Christ. I, I, I have not surrendered my life to him, but you know what? I want to. I want to be in Christ. I want to be called a saint, man. I'm tired of trying to make it through this life, messing everything up. I want to be called a saint. I want to be in Jesus Christ today. If that's you, I just want you to slip up your hand. I'm just going to pray for you. That's it. You say, I want to be in Jesus Christ today. I'm going to wait just a second. You say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Okay, I'm going to assume we all good in here. So the next thing I want to I tell you is that maybe there's something going on in your life. Maybe you realize that maybe you've been worshiping something that isn't God. Maybe you've allowed something to come into your life and take the center place. That even though you should be in Christ, you've been looking and pulling your identity from something, someone else. Just like the video that opened this whole thing up. You saw them looking in the mirror and they were being, they were being exposed for what their idol was. Some of them hated the way they looked and they were trying their best just to change the way they looked. Others were needing affirmation from friends to come in and tell them something so they could feel good about themselves. Someone else was so obsessed with how they looked on social media and what other people thought of them. They were not even paying attention to their own child. And another one, all too familiar, they got their value and their worth with how much money they had in their pocket. Man, if I had to live my life with that, oh my goodness, it wouldn't look good. <laughs> so maybe you're carrying one of those idols and you say, you know what, today I'm surrendering that because I realize that I need to be, I need to get in position. So I'm going to surrender this thing. I'm going to stop worshiping this thing and I'm going to shift my worship, my daily worship, what I pour into, what I pour my affection into, I'm putting it in Christ. And if that's you, I personally want you to make this decision. I'm, I'm going to pray here in a minute, and we're going to take communion together as a church body, as a church family, in the, the blood and the, the body of Christ that was broken for us. We're going to take that together. See, because it's unity in Christ that brings us together. That's what makes us a family. It's in Christ. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. He is what each of us stones come together to make a holy temple. It's in Christ. So I'm going to pray, and then they're going to begin to pass out communion. Vicente is just going to sing a little bit, and I want you to spend some time getting things right with Jesus. If you say, man, I've got some sin going on in my life, man, repent of that stuff. Put it down. That's not who you are. Put it down. Give it to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for speaking to us. Holy Spirit, I thank you for moving on hearts. I thank you for bringing revelation, that we didn't just gain some knowledge. We gained revelation today that we know who we are in Christ and that in Christ, we are saints. We no longer have to sit there and say, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner and beat ourselves up. Instead, we can say, I'm a saint and occasionally I do struggle, but the closer and closer I get to the Father, the closer and closer I get to him, the more and more I look like him and I struggle with all of this stuff way less. So we thank you for that. So God, I pray a blessing over each and every person here. Father, if there's something going on in their lives, I pray they would surrender it now. God, and they would focus on you. They would let go of the sin. They would let go of the idols. And they would put you in center place. And God, they wouldn't listen to the lies of the enemy. they say, oh, you're so bad, and I can't believe you would do that. God, we all struggle. Lord, we all need you. We bring nothing to the table. We need you. So God, I pray, do the work. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.